have the pleasure of introducing uh, Alessandro Grosso today. Um, he's requested that the, his introduction be somewhat short, so I'll respect that. And all I want to say is that, you know, Alessandro is a postdoc at the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics um, in Trieste, Italy. His current research focuses on computational neuroscience and machine learning and bringing <coughs> ideas from statistical physics into, um, into both of those uh, subjects. And today he's going to be talking about a recent paper of his uh, titled The Data-Driven Emergence of Convolutional Structure in Neural Networks. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Alessandro. Take it away. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you very much, John, for the introduction, also actually for inviting me for this. So as Neraj said, uh, I really prefer to keep this interactive and to have questions during the talk and not at the end. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. So in the next 34 or five minutes, I'm going to tell you about the project, which I started a long time ago and, and it started from actually a sort of a neuroscientific questions about the emergence of localized fields such that uh, those ones that we observe in uh, perceptual uh, parts of the brain, like in audition, uh, vision, and with all the possible caveats, also in representational space, what people call the uh, play cells, and then gradually sort of turn into a, a project on, on the dynamics of, uh, of brain descent, dynamics of learning, and, and, and had a sort of a plot twist uh, when I randomly uh, stumbled on a, on a paper on tensor decomposition, which I truly didn't know about. And then at some point, uh, so Sebastian, this is a joint work with Sebastian, uh, Sebastian Gold, I want to say, uh, from CISA, that's the, another institution in, in Trieste, which is called, uh, if you guys don't know it, it's like the Italian city of science for the richness of, of um, scientific institution in the city. So uh, to this crowd, I don't have to uh, stress so much uh, how data symmetries are important for learning and for uh, uh, constructing efficient representation. And uh, normally sort of the, the flow that was also one of the uh, starting point of the deep learning revolution in, in a sense with the introduction of, introduction of convolution neural networks is that symmetries in the data call for appropriate network architecture, which are sort of able to deal with them and to construct effective representation uh, layer by layer. And, and we know that this uh, leads to sample and parameter efficient learning. Uh, in particular, uh, sort of the most celebrated and maybe the, the easiest one and the one that which I'll focus on in this talk is translation invariance. And translation invariance sort of led to the introduction of convolutional neural networks. What we know, uh, sort of it's true anecdotically, and in this pretty recent paper was shown to a very high degree of detail, convolutional neural networks are extremely stronger, stronger and, uh, than uh, fully connected neural networks when, they, when you have to deal with vision tasks. Uh, and, and I want to highlight that in this particular paper, they asked the question if uh, deep neural nets really need to be deep and convolutional. And they say, yes, they do. And what they did was not uh, only train end-to-end uh, -end, uh, convolutional networks uh, with respect to fully connected networks, but they also uh, uh, use the distillation uh, perspective in which uh, they, they both train, they, they uh, compared end-to-end -end training to uh, training in the representation before the, 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 the last layer, the decoding layer. And then they show that there's always a very strong gap between what fully connected networks can do uh, at, any, at any depth and convolutional neural networks. So uh, the hallmarks of convolution, uh, which I'll be, uh, I'll be concerned about during this talk, uh, are local connectivity and weight sharing. So the fact that uh, filters in convolutional networks are sort of a local in space, and then they tile the entire in space. And fully connected neural network performs much worse in typical uh, image classification tasks. So uh, what we asked was, can we actually learn a symmetry structure directly from data? Can we learn a convolutional structure uh, just from scratch? So we start from a fully connected neural network, does the gradient descent dynamics, can, uh, uh, can converge onto a convolutional structure. 
It turns out uh, people have been asking this question uh, before, and then they and they actually found some pretty interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, this recent paper by uh, Dascoli and and uh, the Biroli group showed that uh, the convolution initialization is is, is very important uh, for the SGD to be able to actually find a convolutional structure. If you basically initialize in a uh, with a convolutional uh, structure, a fully connected network, uh, it immediately goes away. The convolutional structure loses uh, the, uh, it goes out of the convolution subspace. But there are sort of flux tubes in the dynamics of uh, grain descent in which the gradient can be trapped if you let the, uh, the, the convolutional network train for some time and then initialize a fully connected network in that, in that uh, place. So the, the loss landscape is extremely complicated. The gradient, the gradient for sort of entropic reasons uh, uh, tends to escape convolutional structure. But if you initialize properly, and in this case, they initialize using a convolution, a, a trained convolutional network, then the gradient stays there and, and sort of uh, keeps uh, the, the, the structure of the initialization. Uh, other than that, you can sort of force uh, the network to uh, look at uh, localized features in the images by uh, a very aggressive regularization, like, like in this paper, New Rips, uh, 2020, or using some pruning or actually iterative pruning approaches in which you, you sort of keep uh, only the, uh, the, the weights which are highest and then you, you kill all the other weights and what you get uh, using Cypher 10, using ImageNet on sort of pretty complicated architectures, uh, what you get in the end are sort of localized uh, fields in the first layer. Uh, what we found and what we thought was that uh, these uh, architectures are a little bit too complicated in the sense that these two papers uh, look at uh, two, or two or three layer neural networks with uh, pooling, dropout, and, and uh, so, uh, so it's, it's very hard to sort of uh, construct a theory for the dynamics of gradient descent in that case. And they also uh, use ImageNet, Cypher 10, so some, some data set on which we, uh, we, we know something uh, about the, uh, the low dimensional structure of the data set, but you don't have full control on the statistical structure of the data set. So we decided to sort of uh, change the perspective com uh, completely and look for the simplest data set on which we have full uh, statistical control and the simplest architecture. So we tried to, came, to come up with the minimal model lateral images ever, and sort of a high dimensional data set in which we, uh, we can uh, tune higher order spatial uh, correlation. So we start from a model of images uh, in which each pixel zi in the class mu is a Gaussian uh, which is which has a, a translation in bias structure. So it's a Gaussian process, um, zero mean in which the, the correlation between two pixels, uh, the intensity of two pixels, i and j in the class mu uh, is just the function of the distance between i and j. This is one dimension. Uh, the, the next, in the next slide, I will have two dimensional uh, inputs, but it's basically the same. You have a periodic boundary condition. You can just take the tensor product of these two covariances and construct um, the uh, translation invariant covariance on the torus. And in this particular case, the uh, correlation goes down uh, uh, like a Gaussian, so exponentially to the square of the distance. And uh, the, the, the structure of the covariance is controlled by a parameter, a length scale, which is, um, which is different for different categories. So we have different categories of images which at the beginning are, 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 are just Gaussian with translation invariant covariances. And then what we do is that we take this uh, Gaussian variable, we pass them through a nonlinearity. In this case, this nonlinearity psi is uh, like a sigmoid nonlinearity. It's a nerve function just for concreteness and, and because it's easier to uh, carry out the Gaussian integral. With uh, normalization z, which is a function of a gain parameter such that the variance of x is always one. And the mean, of course, is zero because psi is a symmetric function around zero. So to be concrete in two dimension, uh, uh, with g equal to zero, or if you want just, uh, if you take uh, the, the original z, 
uh, you have sort of blurred image with certain uh, with the intensity which varies in in space and it goes down exponentially fast. And as you increase the gain, you get uh, stronger, stronger edges in the images, which are caused by the fact that this psi is a squashing uh, nonlinearity. So now what we do is that we, we only have one parameter, this psi mu, and we construct different classes of images with different uh, spatial covariances, the different uh, uh, spatial structures. And keep in mind that this psi mu now in the next slide will we'll, uh, we'll go from one to two, and I call the one minus and two plus. So we're going to have two, uh, two classes of uh, covariances and also two classes of images. So as I said, we take the simplest uh, data set possible, the simplest statistical model for images, and we also take the simplest uh, model for computation, let's say. So, uh, a neural network with one layer, one hidden layer. So we have the input, the size of the input is D, and K hidden neuron with uh, uh, different nonlinearities. In this case, I'll show for Earth nonlinearity, but the same works with sigmoid nonlinearity and tan H nonlinearity, and then a single linear output. And what we want to do is that we want to solve, uh, we want to solve the task in which the network has to tell apart uh, images with short range versus long range correlation. So there is a single parameter, which is Xi, and we have Xi minus versus Xi, xi plus. We show a, a, a huge number of images to the network, and we train both online and offline in the sense we either use, we, we both use a, a batch approach in which we have many of those images, or an online setting in which uh, the, the gradient doesn't see, uh, only sees um, uh, each, um, each image once, and then you can basically sample an infinite number of images, in the end, and each time you take a very tiny step. And this is a good limit for, uh, for actually uh, constructing the, the theory of the dynamics of the gradient descent. And what we find is that at the end of training, uh, the uh, receptive field, so the input weights of these hidden units, Tend to sort of uh, cluster in two different two different sets. There is a set of oscillating receptive fields. I'm calling uh, I'm calling receptive fields the the set of uh, weights onto uh, each unit, and I'm plotting them uh, uh, sort of with a reshaping in 2D to uh, shape them in, in the same shape of the input. And then there is a uh, there is a set of purely localized receptive fields. So they're they're strongly localized in space. And as you can see, we can sort of measure this localization as a function of uh, training time using an inverse participation ratio, which is basically a, a, a spatial kurtosis of each weight and in 1D or 2D. And so you see that this, the oscillatory, for the oscillatory ones, the uh, inverse participation ratio basically stays uh, close to zero. Uh, scales like one over n or one over d, sorry, uh, during training. And then at some point you see uh, an increase uh, during training of the inverse participation ratio, which sort of signals the localization of uh, some of the uh, input weights. Hello, Sandro. I have yes. a question. Can you explain how the oscillatory receptor field images are generated? Uh, these guys or these guys? Uh, so first, <laughs> yeah, right oh, yeah. below the localized receptor field images, like the four uh, and maybe your third panel. Yeah, so uh, these ones are basically generated by first drawing, uh, drawing um, random Gaussians. So this is 1D. You can think that I and J can be multi-indices in 2D with a certain correlation in space. Sorry, I think I'm, I'm referring to the images after training, where you're looking at the receptor fields. These ones. Yeah. So the top, the top localized receptor fields make sense to me. Those are the weights. Um, These are the, oh, oh, uh, they're both the weights. Both yeah. Weights. How do you get the bottom row? Um, I just uh, that's uh, in the same way as I get the 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 upper row. Basically, I take uh, one one of those. Can you see my my mouse? Mm -hmm. So like, let's consider this guy, this in the neuron, and we plot all the weights, okay? And then reshape into D. And then I'm plotting eight of those. 
I'm just uh, I just sort of collected the first four, and they are the one they are the localized ones, and then the other are stuff which is not localized. So the blue are the ones not localized, and I see, I see, I see. So those are not seen. I see. Yeah. Thanks. So there's no there's no difference between top and bottom. It's just a random random collection. Yeah, different selection of input. Thanks. Different selection, sorry. Yes. So. Uh, after that, what we did, we uh, constructed effective, effectively Gaussian clone of our input axis. Uh, basically, we uh, construct a Gaussian control with images in each um, in each class, which have the same first, the second order moments, but different for four order moments. So we take the covariance of these inputs and we construct uh, Gaussian uh, images with the same covariance and the same for the second class. So these two classes are basically the same up to the covariance, but of course uh, the, the inputs axis, which are referred to as NLGP, non-linear Gaussian process, uh, they have a high order structure which is absent in the GP, the, the purely Gaussian control. So uh, we set this new task we initialize the we initialize the network exactly in the same place in the same place. So the, the second layer weight, the first layer weight is, are the same. Same initialization. We get the same uh, sort of oscillatory safety fields, but the localized one they uh, they no localize at all in the sense they keep the the, the oscillatory structure but with a lower uh, lower frequency. And as you can see, basically the inverse participation ratio for the low frequency receptive field is basically the same as the one of the high frequency receptive field. So we don't see any localization uh, during learning when we construct the Gaussian clone of our uh, initial images. So when we now scale the number K, which is the number of the, the width of the first layer, first hidden layer, so the number of hidden neurons, what we see is that the, each of these localized receptive fields sort of picks a different position, and you have sort of a, a tiling, an homogeneous tiling in the whole input space. This is in 2D. Maybe it's easier in, in 1D if I plot on the uh, on the x-axis. I have the input dimension, and each row is an, is um, is one receptive field, so one uh, input vector to a hidden neuron, and it's a color plot. And you can see uh, that basically you have zero weights and then uh, all the, the weights tend to be uh, localized in a very uh, small part of the of the image and so as to sort of tile uh, the entire the tile the entire image. Of course I'm showing only half the weights. You have uh, in this case like it's a it's a it's a neural network with I guess 200 in the neurons. And so like a hundred of those will tile the input space and a hundred of those will, will be strongly oscillatory. And then if you uh, if you do the same, if you play the same game with a convolutional network, so you have exactly the same task, uh, but you train uh, a two-layer convolutional network on the same task, what you get is that the, the learned filter in the convolutional network, they strongly resembles the one that the, the weights that you get from the in the fully connected network. So in this plot here on the left, I'm basically um, superimposing, overlaying many of the uh, of the uh, input weights for different hidden neurons, and on the right, I train uh, a convol convolutional network on the same task with different uh, sizes for the kernel. So this KS here stands for the kernel size. I go from nine to fifty-nine, so I increase the size of the kernel, and and the the, the kernels of the filter they strongly resembles. Uh, across the kernel size, the uh, the weight vectors that uh, I get when I train uh, fully connected network. So it, it sort of it makes sense that the the, the only solution which is there, uh, like the, the solution which uh, with small entropy, is the one that uh, that, um, that that is that that the the convolutional network can find and the fully connected uh, fully connected network can converge to. So what's going on? Why, why are we observing this kind of uh, phenomenology? Uh, can we build a theory for it? So uh, we start with the theory that doesn't work. 
which is a purely Gaussian theory for the uh, pre-activation at the level of the hidden limit. We have a theory which goes with the name of Gaussian equivalence, dates back to uh, classical work by uh, David Saad and Sarah Solla on the dynamics of gradient descent in the online setting. The idea is very simple. You have uh, a one layer, um, a one layer, uh, one hidden layer neural network with input X, first layer weights, uh, weight matrix W. And you look at the pre-activation before the, uh, the nonlinear activation function HK for each hidden neuron K, which is the scalar product between the, uh, the weight vector WK and the input X. So you have basically D times K uh, possible parameters. And in principle, you'd have to track the dynamics of D times K uh, parameter. The idea is, is that you can sort of encapsulate uh, the properties in a joint distribution of this vector HK and assume that this joint distribution is Gaussian, is jointly Gaussian. So you take the vector H to be at each point during learning um, a Gaussian with maybe some, some uh, a joint Gaussian with maybe some, uh, uh, some average mu K, which in our case would be zero, and uh, a K times K. Uh, overlap matrix uh, QKL, which basically represents the, the covariance between the activity of neuron K and the activity of neuron uh, L. And you can sort of compute uh, these, these quantities, at least at the initialization, uh, starting from W, okay, starting from the value of the first layer. And so you, 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 do, you can do a reduction from an, uh, what, what in statistical physics is called like an extensive uh, quantity to an intensive quantity. So from, from DK parameters, so you have the, the scaling with the size of your system D to K. So you have K, K averages plus K times K minus two, uh, which is the, the number of independent uh, parameters in the, in the overlap matrix. And so it turns out that uh, if you sort of com uh, com compute this mu and k at, at the starting, at the, at the initialization, then you have just to follow the dynamics of mu and, and q over, over training. And if you do that, you can actually compute the, the, the prediction mean square, so the average error across uh, all the possible pairs, uh, say, of um, input and output. And you can follow the whole dynamics of the gradient descent just in terms of the order parameters q. Why did I say that Gaussian equivalence uh, doesn't hold in this case? Because we, uh, we, we tried to uh, compute um, what happens at the level of the, uh, at the Gaussian level. What we found is that when you train on the original X, so uh, the nonlinear Gaussian processes data, uh, the, the loss that you obtain is lower than GP. You can see that here I plotted uh, in the blue, you have a cross uh, training, the, the, the average loss, uh, the average validation, uh, so the, 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 the test, the, the test error uh, as a function of, of training time. When I train the, the Gaussian clone, so the GP, the original and a GP, the orange one, and then I also plot um, the test error of a network train on Gaussian data and evaluated on non-Gaussian data, just to make sure uh, that uh, the, the, the network train on GP, so the red one, uh, makes basically the same error on, on NLGP data uh, because it, it could basically could not catch structure which is not represent which is not represented at the level of the second order moment. So uh, we applied the Gaussian equivalence theorem, uh, uh, sort of a generalization of the original work by uh, Saad and Sola, which was done by uh, by Sebastian Gold, uh, Florian uh, Sarkala, Lenkas de Borov, and others. Uh, it was sort of generalized to uh, different situations in which you have correlated data and Gaussian mixtures and the structure and teacher student scenarios in which the teacher has a different structure in the student. There's how we can actually evaluate test error when we have the Gaussian input. So when we uh, train on GP, you can see that the theory uh, matches the, the simulation very well. The, the, the blue uh, crosses. Uh, they are exactly on the blue and the red one. It makes sense they are on the blue because uh, Gaussian input naturally imply a Gaussian uh, joint distribution at the level of the hidden units. 
And it makes sense also that we can uh, um, compute exactly what happens when you train on Gaussian data and evaluate on non-Gaussian data. So this GP evaluated on NNGP. What happens is that we can, with the theory, we can follow up to some point the dynamics of the test error when we train on nonlinear uh, Gaussian data, so on, on uh, data with higher order structure. And then at some point we lose the we lose uh, lose the curve, and that means that basically the Gaussian equivalence uh, breaks down and doesn't hold anymore. And interestingly, if uh, interestingly, if you uh, plot the uh, IPR as a function of time, you see that the the level in which the Gaussian uh, theory uh, for the hidden activation starts uh, starts breaking down is uh, is exactly where you see uh, the, the localization happening. So what what this plot is saying is basically that when you when you see an increase in the inverse participation ratio, which signals a localization of the hidden neuron, the formation of localized fatty fields, then the structure of the hidden representation is not uh, jointly Gaussian anymore, and any Gaussian theory will, uh, will break down. And it's interesting to see that basically up to this point, you can see, you can think that the network learned only uh, second differences in second orders between the two classes. So it first learned the covariance, and then at this point it goes, it, it, it sort of jumps from a second order to higher order, and it focuses on higher order moments, and it's impossible for a Gaussian theory at, at the hidden layer to actually uh, catch this behavior. So this is a theory that we, uh, at some point uh, stops working. What do we do? Uh, so the simplest thing you could do is that you take, uh, instead of taking uh, big K, you take K equal to one. And so you start, uh, you try and build a theory for the uh, good and old perceptron. Uh, and in order to connect the receptive field formation to data geometry, we took K equal to one. Uh, so you have uh, the, the output Y is just some uh, nonlinearity of W scalar X, and we want to uh, find what the dynamics of W during learning is. And what we do is that we uh, expand the, the nonlinearity up to third order, and we find that this is the, uh, the, the smallest expansion for which we can actually retain the whole phenomenology without losing anything. And this is uh, an expansion up to third order with, with a capture of what happens for, say, tan H or sigmoid nonlinearities. And then we write an equation for the dynamics of gradient descent in the limit of very small uh, learning rates, so a gradient flow dynamics. Uh, so uh, this is basically the sum over m is the number of, uh, of classes, so it's an average over the number of classes. And then we have basically when you span to third order, you have two terms. And uh, the first term is dependent of the, on the co class uh, in, um, inside class covariance. And the, uh, this, uh, this other term is dependent on, on the uh, inside class four order tensor. So C i j mu is the covariance between x i and x j in the class mu. And by absolute, by construction is the same for GP and NLGP data. And uh, T, this T mu is the four order tensor. So it's T, I, uh, J, K, L is just the average sandwich over uh, the, 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 the product between um, values at four different pixels in the, uh, inside the class mu. And we can uh, easily split this into a Gaussian and a non-Gaussian contribution. So the, the, we write the moment as a term which comes from the, from the previous moment, so from the covariance and the cumulant. So from the Wick theorem, we can easily write that this uh, for for the moment is uh, the sum of product of two uh, covariances plus a non-Gaussian contribution, uh, a new contribution, which is the, the cumulant. And so we can rewrite the gradient flow equation when we basically take in, 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 um, in green everything which is true already at the Gaussian level. So we have uh, C2 multiplying C mu, and then this new uh, effective interaction um, between weights, which is only mediated globally by this single overlap term. This Q mu is basically the same 
as the, the, the QKL, which I was showing, but for the case of uh, BK equal to one. And then we have another contribution which uh, links different weights in a very, uh, in a nonlinear way. So you have, of course, a third order interaction between weights, which is mediated by the fourth order cumulant of the inputs. So in order to understand the dynamics of this gradient flow, what we do is that we uh, use a CP decomposition because this guy here is, is hell. It's, uh, it's really complicated to understand what it, what it will do um, to, to the dynamics. And so we can take um, uh, a perspective which is sort of similar to eigenvalue decomposition, but for the fourth order uh, cumulant. So we use the CP or Parafac countercomp decomposition, which is basically we take the all um, fourth order cumulant which is a, a complicated monster in, in, a, in a x to the four and in d to the four. And then we try and, and decompose it as a sum of, uh, uh, of um, tensor product which is with, between uh, single vectors. So uh, this, we, we select a number r of uh, vectors uk. So k goes from one to, from one to r. And so we can sort of decompose the whole uh, four for the uh, cumulant. It was impossible to do it in four dimensions. So I represented it in three dimension as a sum of, uh, of uh, rank, uh, rank one terms, which are uh, uh, multiplication tensor, sensor multiplication between single, uh, single factors, so-called. So what we find is that for G, the gain factor very close to zero. So basically for, for Gaussian input, the CP factors here, so I'm plotting in, in the function of the input dimension, each of these UK, uh, they oscillate in space. So in, in gray, you're seeing the, the, the spatial structure of, of the CP factor, the fourth order cumulant. And the weight vector, uh, which uh, where the uh, the Gaussian flow, uh, the, the the gradient flow converges to, is of course uh, not localized. Now, if you increase the gain, so you increase the the weight of the four for the cumulant, what you see is that so for strongly non Gaussian input, the CP factors themselves localize the space and actually tile the input space. So you can see that the CP factors here, the, the green ones. Uh, we, we, here, I guess I, I took the composition rank 20. So R is 20 here. Uh, they are localized and they, they, they really look like the, the, the final weight. So, and actually what happens is that the, the weight vector at the end of the training uh, localizes and based on the initial condition, uh, it sort of flows onto the one uh, which maximizes the order. So uh, if you, uh, if you think of the overlap between W and one of these UK at the beginning, there's sort of um, an, an equivalent um, attractor, uh, attractor um, mechanism which drives it onto the one uh, which maximizes the, the initial overlap. So it selects one and, and align onto uh, the way it aligns onto one of these uh, CP factors. What we actually found is that uh, we can um, sort of study the structure of the resulting weight uh, as a function of the structure of the CP factor when we change the two uh, toggles that we have. So we have a parameter G and a parameter Psi. What we can do is, uh, for instance, uh, plot the, the localization, so the inverse, uh, the inverse participation ratio, when we take uh, the, the Xi fix and then we increase the gain. So as you increase basically the non gaussianity on the data, you get the localization of the CP factor. Here, these two, uh, these two curves for different size uh, signal the fact that as you increase the non gaussianity on the data, increasing the gain, then you have uh, a stabilization of, of the of the spatial structure of the CP factor, and then um, the, the the dynamics. So the the the, the value at which the weights converges uh, follows the dynamics of the, the CP factors G increases. So here these two lines represent the uh, the final uh, locality of the uh, Gaussian flow. And then on the other hand, if you play the same game with uh, 
with the absence of the delta t factor. So you have uh, you set g to zero if you want, or uh, basically you run the the the, um, the, the Gaussian the um, the gradient flow uh, without a without the uh, the delta t uh, delta t um, uh, delta t factor, then basically there is no localization as a function of g. Then you can play uh, play sort of the, the dual game in which you uh, plot the uh, width of the receptive fields using uh, gf or using plain sgd. So you just train a perception with normal sgd, and then you confront the, uh, the, the spatial structure, uh, the, the half width of the receptive fields on the weight on, with that of the, uh, the the maximum CP factor as you vary the input correlation length. So I, I kept G fixed in this case, G is equal to two and I vary Psi. And as you can see, as the CP factor here in green uh, tends to uh, tends to widen, uh, the same happens for the dynamics of GF, uh, which is sort of a, an approximation of what happens in the, uh, if you actually train with stochastic gradient descent. Okay, I think that is basically all. Uh, the lesson we learned from this is that we have to go beyond Gaussian models for data. And this is sort of a lesson for uh, also everyone doing uh, replica calculation using statistical mechanics analysis of uh, training in a neural network for, with uh, uh, goes from, from perception to community machines. And we have to go beyond Gaussian models for, for data and also for the uh, representation for the joint distribution of internal representation. So we sort of have to uh, jump from IID data to structure data, the level of the covariance to higher order structure in the input. And then we found that this, uh, this higher order structure is able to uh, explain the emergence of localization and the emergence of uh, tessellation of the input space. And so uh, the way we can actually uh, train a fully connected network to reach a convolutional structure uh, using uh, plain uh, vanilla grain descent. Uh, of course, we need a better understanding of the interaction in the dynamics of grain descent between the higher order, the higher order tensor and any learning algorithm. There is a very interesting paper by Hawker and Buys, and they showed in, in the unsupervised learning setting that you can sort of generalize the, uh, the Auger rule to uh, a nonlinear uh, version in which instead of uh, converging to the highest, uh, the, the, the eigenvector of the covariance with the highest uh, eigenvalue, you sort of converge uh, to the uh, highest factor, uh, actually, actually a tiger factor of the uh, relevant uh, higher order tensor. And we think that there's a, there's a very interesting direction uh, which can be opened up by, uh, by this work, which is the study of transition uh, or phase transition in higher order random tensors. So it, it is just at this level purely speculative, but the idea is that as you increase the, uh, the number of samples, then you, you're gonna see more and more uh, appearing the structure in the CP factors at the level of the tensor. Here, I'm, I'm showing that as you increase the size, see the input dimension D to 250 to 1000, and then you increase the number of patterns. Um, for small number of patterns, of course, uh, the, the, this, uh, this uh, localization structure is, is hidden. Uh, you don't have enough sample, but then at some point, uh, there is enough sample to actually detect it. And so uh, this is telling you that in order to learn a certain symmetry, in this case, uh, in this case, a translational symmetry, you need uh, a, a strong signal, uh, which uh, has to be, uh, of course, has to be there in the uh, in the sampling, and and you need a, a lot of a lot of data to actually be able to see it. But uh, I mean, uh, the same relation between spectra. And eigenvectors will probably um, probably happen here at the level of spectra uh, of the CP the composition uh, and and uh, um, and global global aspect of the factors. So we, we, we expect basically to have some sort of concentration at the level of uh, the, the the spatial structure of the highest uh, of the highest uh, of the strongest 
CD factor. And to conclude, uh, of course, we would like to be able to, uh, to do this for a general symmetry group. Uh, and and what, what this uh, elementary or rudimentary theory is telling us is that in, or, in order to understand how the SGD learning dynamics can converge to a representation which is invariant to any symmetry group, we need to be able to understand what's the impact of, of a symmetry group on higher order statistics on the input. And then uh, the, the grain descent will sort of uh, catch first on the second order structure and then on higher order structure represented by uh, the decomposition of higher order um, cumulants. And with that, I guess I can open up for questions. Sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you. Was there a question? I thought so, but I couldn't hear it either. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, I just said thanks, Alessandro, and mm -hmm. I was saying, uh, everyone, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any question and questions and ask directly to Alessandro. I'll start one, uh, start off with the questions. So what aspects of your uh, model do you think would change in the presence of different symmetries? Oh, I have absolutely no idea. That's the first thing I will do is that I take the easiest symmetry, which is like a rotational symmetry, and try and see what's the... Uh, what's the impact on second order structure or, or third order structure, but it's a completely open. Um, maybe I have a question. Does this tell us anything about how the brain might have evolved? That's a very good question. So this was actually like the, the starting point for this, I guess we can think in terms of, yeah, we can say that if we, we don't really believe that uh, the gradient descent is actually implemented in the brain, maybe. But so the fact that the dynamics of gradient descent goes on to this solution uh, tells us something about the, uh, the fact that this is a sort of a global optimum of a loss uh, energy function. It doesn't depend on the actual algorithm. And so this is probably telling us that uh, the optimal way to, uh, to represent, uh, an in, uh, I mean, a, a, very, a very easy uh, translation invariant structure is to have localized receptive fields, yes without making any assumption on the actual evolutionary dynamics, but just thinking in terms of the loss landscape and the fact that any algorithm will converge to that kind of minimum in the loss landscape. Any other questions? Not. I think let's thank Alessandro for his wonderful presentation. And what's the time, Alessandro, at your place? It's uh, it's almost nine. Okay, great, great. All right, thank you so much uh, for presenting today, and thanks, John, for bringing oh, thank in you, yeah, Alessandro. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Take care. All right. Bye.